Hi, <laughs> finally. <laughs> Been trying to figure out. Okay, we're on live. Good, good, good. We Shall we wait for Miguel? Yeah? Well, we can, yeah. Miguel, are you there? It says recently active. So it looks like it's just the three of us in here. Okay. Although it says seven. And, uh, seven? That, right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The participants. Who would like to kick off? You are both veterans of this conference. I've, um, I've moderated a panel before. So... <laughs> Should I wait? Okay, well, well we can go on. Um, so, yeah. So what is... Right? Uh, so the topic for today, for us, is sustainable investment, investing to foster shared humanity. Now, this is a very big topic, uh, but I think, yeah, it's, uh, but it's increasingly becoming topical um, because, you know, it has, uh, this pandemic has, um, to some extent, to a lot of extent, provoked uh, many people in the in investing industry and an outside investing industry to be more aware of uh, of, of this issue and not only be aware, but also come up with a, a specific solution and, and in some cases even come up with new products. Um, so it's a, it's an interesting topic to talk about. Um, so who wants to kick off with an idea and experience um, on this topic? Um, which you wanted yeah, to yeah, okay, yeah. okay, yeah. Uh, as uh, you know, uh, uh, Kitamura san talk right now, uh, it's a big, big topic. Uh, and uh, uh, as for me, I'm not a uh, you know, uh, investment industry, I'm um, I, I am running my own company, uh, for you know, concierge service company. A concierge service, lifestyle management service uh, company for Asian uh, luxury travelers, luxury people, high net worth individuals. And the uh, idea to uh, spin off my travel business uh, last year after pandemic uh, because the uh, I have a definite um, you know, uh, I, I definitely think that the era of the ESG investment uh, for, of course, travel industry uh, will come. Uh, so, for for example, or the original idea or original opinion uh, from my side is the, for example, or what is the um uh all the companies globally so for for example top 10 of all these companies globally uh, out of top 10 uh, the seven companies is in japan right now and the the oldest one is the uh miyadai uh sorry um uh, there's a construction company, a carpenter's company, carpenters specializing in uh, shrines and temples, restoring shrines and temples. And the second one is the Onsen Hotel, or uh, which, you know, or uh, purify your body and soul. So um, I think we have to learn the history of the companies, it's uh, companies themselves, uh, because the you know, oh, that is a sustainability itself. I think so. Oh, that's one of my uh, agendas today. Mm. Mm. So yeah, it's quite surprising. Seven out of ten now the oldest companies is in Japan. I can't believe it. But the <laughs> all seven is that. all seven are uh, you know on sand and the carpenters company. But the, yeah, but the, realistically speaking, the, the, the most oldest company, uh, we call it the Kongo Gumi, uh, it started maybe 650, 650 uh, you know, 1500 years ago, actually was acquired by a big construction company two or three years maybe ago. 
Uh, so the most sustainable one, uh, even the most sustainable company, he, uh, how do I say, uh, was acquired, was financially acquired. So um, we have learned the, uh, the company history, but the, how do I say, financial system, uh, you know, how do I say, grabs the, mm. how do I say, the uh, sustainable, sustainability history itself. Right. No, thank mm. you very much for the insight. I didn't even know that our company, our country had seven of the 10 oldest companies in the world. Um, um, okay. Um, Fred, Frederick, do you have any views? Can you share with us any views? Well, thank you so much for facilitating us, uh, Keta <laughs> uh, You're not meant oh, to do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm too much yeah. listening to you. I don't know if you are listening oh, to me. Well, you are. <laughs> but, well, I'm not listening to you. I'm sorry. Oh, really? Oh, well, yeah. Welcome aboard. I, I, I don't know what is happening here. Yes, I can no hear worries. Uh, well, but it looks like we don't have a big audience, but I will not interrupt. You can keep on because I'm not listening to you. So, oh, take the mic out of me. I see. Okay. Well, that doesn't help very much. We can I don't hear know you. what I can do. That doesn't help much. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, at least, at least so, you know, you know, are raising here. I, mean, this, I didn't expect you to be bringing this one up. Uh, as uh, yeah. uh, Masubuchi san, as a as a as a frame in terms of these companies with longevity, but as you say, by definition, they have sustainability, right? And uh, now, of course, one thing so many of them have in common is not to grow very much, right? To privilege consistency and stability over growth, right? Because none of them have grown into very large companies. That in itself creates a a point of weakness over that sustainability. And so in that sense, it goes very much counter to you know, principles of, of capitalism, of neoliberalism, which is seeking economic growth, of course, expansion, etc. cetera. Um, but um, I, I want to pick up on, on the thing, and, and I do think there's a lot to be inspired by and to learn. And uh, so no doubt about this. And, and yes, Sweden has a few, Switzerland, Germany, etc. But these are countries also that have had a certain degree of stability. Otherwise, you cannot you know, have companies that maintain over such a period of time. What, what I have been excited about, so we, many of us have had to, to adjust our business models, right? The ones that didn't have to adjust their business models at all during the pandemic are the ones that are doing phenomenally well because whatever their business model was ready for a situation of lockdown, right? The rest of us, including our own company, has had to adjust. And one thing we did was actually to adjust our frontline reporting solutions to the question of the pandemic and to know what's happening. Uh, so really nothing that was in our business plan at all, but helping in 27 countries to report on the health emergency. Okay, this is the most direct expression of this shift. Mm -hmm. But one thing I'll, I want to share that I'm very inspired by at the moment, is a shift. So when we were invited, it was talking about ESG. ESG is still, a lot of it is compliance-based. A lot of it is based on really quite imperfect data. And if the pandemic taught us anything, it is the importance of reliable data, right? If you don't have reliable data on transmission incidences, etc., it's impossible to do good public health policy. Mm. And but in the context of ESG, so much of the data is misleading, is very slow, it's not timely, there's a lot of greenwashing taking place. And so among the things that excite me is the extent to which companies are willing to move beyond the compliance and certification-based model to actually having real data on sustainability. And one of the prime examples is not a company of ours, but we are advising them and it is called Replant in the US, Replant Capital. And they are working uh, to help major brands in the food sector to be able to uh, uh, transition food production to regenerative agriculture. And this is then based on real data and milestones of 
water efficiency, carbon efficiency, soil health, etc. And once the producers achieve those milestones, the brands are guaranteeing them a price. So Replant Capital is able to de-risk the transition. And they are now at $2 billion, seeking they're already past 200 million in very quick order and are going to $2 billion in order to help yeah, the food sector and the farming sector just focused on the US. And we're bringing this model to Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa. So this to me is a wake up call because until recently, the brands were perfectly happy if you just had a certificate. Those certification schemes do not, none of the big certification schemes produce sustainability data. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the, I guess the common theme, right? Coming out of the pandemic, we knew that health data has to be reliable. It has to be timely as well. If we are serious about the climate transition and knowing that the clock is ticking, we have to have real data. And it has to be multifaceted. It cannot just be on one dimension alone. It has to have many dimensions attached to it. So this is the comfort that I'm taking. It's actually moving in a certain sense. You could say it's taking ESG 2.0, right? I don't want to dismiss ESG because we're already still, there's a wave growing here, but it is really taking it to the next level. Right. What about you? Um, myself? Yes. What are you seeing? Well, um, oh, hi, Miguel. How Hello, I'm sorry. Yes, oh, yes. Oh, now so it's finally again. Okay. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Ah, great. <laughs> great. <laughs> so we've been, we've, been, we've been talking one by one um, to, to share our you know, views and experience on sustainable investment. Um, yeah. And we just started off by introducing that there are, you know, the seven out of uh, the ten oldest companies in the world are in Japan, uh, and it, it, it symbolizes the, the sustain, sustainability of these companies. Um, and he went through the, the specific industries uh, of these, you know, sustainable the companies that prove to be sustainable. Um, Frederick went through his um, uh, views on. Um, the certification uh, of uh, the, the companies that you know would would have to prove or show their sustainability, which is, I, I think, you know, it's a long way. To, it's, it's a big challenge, but you need it in order to compare uh, and, and manifest uh, the state sus sus sustainability of the companies. You need hard data, and it brings me to an idea. Of, you know, how did you do that? How did you achieve that? But before that, I want to step back and say, you know, how do you define the criteria for sustainability? There are many kind, there are many ways to define sustainability of the of the companies. There are many definitions of sustainability to begin with. Are we talking about gender equality, environment, food safety, um, you know, um, slavery, cheap labor, um, human rights? Um, in, in my experience. In my industry, it's very hard. I'm from this notion that it's very hard to cover everything. But if you want to cover a specific criteria of sustainability, it's very possible. Um, so you know, we want we want to know where we, we would start from. That, so that that's the sort of. Um, I'm not sure if I, I I summarize it right, but that's the sort of topic that we're we're covering. And I was about to sh to share my. View and, views and experience on this field. Um, I was about to say, you know, first of all, I'm in the private equity industry, private equity industry, uh, where you, you, you're you expected to make returns in, in a short time frame, um, typically three, five years, up to 10 years. And your focus is supposed to be maximizing financial returns. So under that agenda, I think the investment managers tend to be tend to put sustainability of the, the invested companies uh, in lower priority, uh, and I think it has been the case until recently. What has been changing um, in recently and quite rapidly is, first of all, you know the whole, whole discussion, right, uh, about the the sustainable investing and what's happening in the public equity space. You see, you know, managers, investment managers, 
um, applying um, certain criteria to their portfolio companies, and otherwise they wouldn't invest. Now, that's a big statement to make, and it's, it's hardly ignorable uh, as a concept. And secondly, I think that whole concept is, is being applied by investors in private equity. So in, private equity managers tend to be small. They're boutique firms and they're sporadic. But the investors into the funds that they manage are quite big, and, and they're quite um, subject to um, public scrutiny, like pension funds, um, government investment schemes, um, and, you know, money managers. Um, under they're, they're all under public scrutiny, and, you know, because of the, the trend um, on, on sustainable investment, they are expecting the same level or at least similar level or uh, some level of care uh, in, in sustainable investment for us, to us. And that is the pressure that we're, trying, we're, we're beginning to see. Uh, and number three, among, even among the private equity uh, managers, there are um, managers that have become so big that they become listed, like Carlisle, Blackstone, KKR, Apollo, what have you. Um, and, you know, because they are public entities um, managing private equity funds, they are under scrutiny and they are expected to behave in such a way as to, you know, maintain sustainable investment in the space. And, and I think that's becoming a de facto standard very, very slowly. But um, I think at least we are, we are pressured to think, you know, what are we going to do? in order to uh, maintain sustainable investment. It's a good, we all agree it's a good thing, but, uh, but, uh, but the realistic apl application is quite difficult in a sense that, you know, first of all, it's hard to define. Second of all, we are investing in premature companies when it comes to private equity, uh, you know, startups, and also companies that have spun out from big companies or companies that need restructuring. There are many things that we need to prioritize in order to to do what we are expected to do. But on the other hand, we need to, you know, um, come up with a solution to say, hey, well, this investment is sustainable, and we're making good investment for the good, for the sake of the better society. And that's a new homework, a new agenda for us. And I don't think the industry has figured out how to do it yet. Uh if I may, one second. First of all, sorry for getting late. Uh, going direct to the point, uh, I agree with you that uh, it all starts by the definition. And the, and the thing, in my point of view, is that sometimes we lose too much time on uh, complex definitions when, uh, in my point of view, sustainability is very, very simple and it, it needs to be holistic. But it's comp completely incompatible uh, with another thing that you mentioned, which is the short-term uh, 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 focus of uh, most of the financial world. So uh, if we don't change the rules of the game, it's very difficult to change the results. And uh, in my point of view, uh, what we need to do, and, and now talking from a, uh, an entrepreneur point of view, uh, what is really e essential is to have... Uh, you know, a very simple number, a very simple uh, definition uh, that allows people to know, and not only uh, the investors community, but uh, all of us as citizens of the world, to know uh, who are uh, sustainable from the ones that are not sustainable. Even if it is not a precise uh, number that we start with, you know, and all science starts by imprecisions and then uh, as you grow, like, like the computers and like the smartphones, when they start, uh, smartphones, uh, mobile phones, uh, my first mobile phone was 17 kilos and now you have something that uh, it's 300 grams. Uh, so it all starts by something. And what I think it, it should be uh, the, the turning point is uh, when we start engaging uh, you know, the any citizen in the world, and and start um, uh, clarifying from whoever is starting a, a company or an organization that the, that the most important criteria is first and foremost sustainability. And by the way, sustainability, if it is well done uh, in the long term, obviously is highly profitable. 
but it's totally incompatible uh, with a short-term perspective, which is the, sh the perspective that we have today of the markets and the pressure of the executives to deliver results today. So they don't care who will close the door later on. They just want to focus uh, on the results today. So uh, in my point of view, again, uh, to simplify is, is the word and, uh, and to change the way the metrics work. Because if we don't change the metrics and, uh, and the um, uh, compensations that people have in their investment uh, decisions, uh, uh, then it's very difficult to change. And probably when we are forced to change, it could be too, too, too late. So uh, in my point of view, the critical issue is anytime that we start any venture, it can be uh, you know, a company, it can be an unprofit organization, doesn't matter. For us, what is important it is, the, it, it is that the result is sustainable for humankind. And sustainable means that whatever is a solution that you create is a solution that will solve a problem for this and next generations, or at least solve a problem for this generation, but will not compromise or create other problems uh, in the future. And we all know uh, how to do those calculations, uh, and uh, we can do it more or less precision, but anything is better than trying to ignore it and just keep uh, the game as it is. So uh, in, in my final world, uh, world, I think that we need to change the rules of the game. Miguel, thank you. Uh, since we have only you know, a few minutes left in our session, you know, perhaps if, if I would like to respond to you uh, a little bit, if I, if I could, Kedem Hassan, and, and to you, and challenge you a little bit here, Miguel, is, is I don't think the question is so much about short-term, long-term. If you focus on the issues that are material to a particular sector and industry or in luxury travel, clearly the environment right around your know, facilities if they have any proximity to nature is going to be extremely material to that if you are investing in a construction company you know clearly health and safety is important and if you're investing in something uh, like gaming or blockchain solutions uh, although people don't first associate it with it, the carbon footprint is extremely material to that but health and safety is going to be less relevant in that area. And so from a risk perspective, right, not addressing those material issues in the short run will give you very little insight into how well a business is run. And, and whether it's regulatory pressure or other issues, it would be a very serious mistake not to look at those highly material issues, given the particular industry or product. That's a short term yeah. risk management. Yeah, but, but the, the, the things are connected, right? Yeah. In terms of the value creation, right, you're wanting to exit a private equity you know, uh, you know, acquisition after a short period of time, three, four, five years, whatever it is, right? As that company then enters the market for it to be acquired, to do an IPO, whatever it is, again, these are the criteria that people are going to be looking at. In terms of the issues that are material, especially starting with that. Now, what is material can change over time, so it's a bit tricky, right? It's not set in stone. But I would encourage to look at really the material issues when it comes to this. And actually, I think the space that you're in, private equity, is one of the most exciting for the very simple reason that the big data providers are not providing data on most of these companies, either because they're too small or because they're private. And so you have the opportunity to actually tell your own story and to develop yeah, the ESG, the sustainability narrative, really with much more of your own input. Well, our session has elapsed. But we can <laughs> I, I thought we had a few more minutes. But so I'm, I'm apologizing. I didn't mean to take the time. No, yeah, no, I, no. We'll round up session. No, I, I mean, I appreciate your comments. And, and you know, um, I, I, I must say that um, it was around 10 years ago when we started to add ESG as one of the criteria of picking which funds to invest. So we always ask a question, you know, what's your ESG policy? Do you have it in place? Uh, and, and some of the funds that we invested have longer answers and more organized answers, um, and, and some of them didn't. Um, I think what I'm trying to say is that 
you know, there's one thing is to put pressure on them by implementing those uh, criteria. But the other thing is that, you know, do we really have the methodology to, to basically track uh, and even define what we mean by that? Um, you know, yes, you could mean a lot of things. And I, I, take, a, I take a look at my, our, our fund's past portfolio companies. Some of them are fast food restaurants. And fast food restaurants, okay, the, the, the investment went fine in three years, but there are there are concerns about how they make money, right? And and what kind of materials they use to cook the foods. Uh, <laughs> and I, you know, we never asked the question to the fund manager, or even we never asked the, the restaurant chain, what kind of labor, how much do you pay to your to your cheapest employees? What kind of food materials did you use? Did you use this material? Did you use that material? We didn't even ask that question. And and if you and if we are strict ESG implementers, we should have. So I think you can. We could keep on doing this, and we can pursue this hundred percent or nearly hundred percent. And if we apply that criteria, those criteria, I think we we shouldn't have done most of the investments that we've done. So. I think there's a reality to catch up. Mm-hmm. But having said that, um, the fact that, you know, we're having this talk and we're having this notion that ESG should be followed it puts a big pressure on the managers and the companies and it's been already making a big difference. So I'm not saying that we don't have any. Uh, we do have, and, and they're not really meticulous, but we're, we're heading to the right direction. It's definitely having an impact. Um, so, so I, 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 I hope that kind of showed where we are in private equity in terms of ESG implementation. But we've run out of time, unfortunately. Any final thoughts from you, Mr. Richardson? Um, <clears throat> yes, um, you know the word ESG or maybe SDGs or CSR. Um, it's, you know, uh, around us right now. Um, but the, for me, the uh, sustainable or sustainability is the, from my personal investment, uh, you know, views, is the something you can do it for free right now. So uh, I would like to keep my personal investment uh, you know, or maybe three or four uh, uh, was successful, but 30 or 40 was in failure, <laughs> were in failure. Uh, but uh, I like to keep my uh, face in investing uh, from the viewpoint of my own, su- you know, definition of the sustainability. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, uh, we have a uh, you know have to have a long, long journey to define uh, the sustainability itself. Ex- um, actually, so so please keep updated. Thank you very much today. Thank you so much. Well, a pleasure sharing this panel with you, Miguel. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, too. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. All right. Bye-bye.